So picture this. It's around 3 a.m. on a Friday night circa 2012. And at this point, I have been chilling with my friends enjoying various, uh, let's say salad sandwiches for a few hours now. We've been soundtracking this, uh, salad session with your typical pick, Boards of Canada, Pink Floyd, Tangerine Dream, Grateful Dead, Tame Impala, etc. Then, as we were all winding down, getting ready to crash, one of my friends turned to me and said, wait, 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 wait. We gotta listen to this while the aftertaste of the um, <clears throat> salad is still present. So despite all of us being dog tired, we relented and he put on the record. To say none of us were prepared for what we heard was an understatement. We ended up listening to a roughly 45 minute long avant rock opera about a Svengali type character named Mr. X who tours a set of joined twins as miracle healers around the country in various medicine shows while doubting his own sanity and growing attraction to said twins. This album was God in Three Persons by The Resonance, who I later found out after a quick search on my phone looked like this. Between the incredible, um, <clears throat> salad and the effects of this music, I became intrigued to learn more about who this band was why I had never heard of them before, and what other kind of weird music they had up their sleeves. The first thing to know about The Residents is that, well, there is not much definitively known about The Residents even in the year of our Lord 2022, which, when you think about it, is kind of an amazing feat. Since the time of their inception, up until present, the identity of the individual members of the residents has remained entirely secret. There are a few key players who have often been suspected of being members of the residents, but again, to this day, nothing has been definitively confirmed. They could be your local mechanic or literally Paul McCartney. We just don't know. What we do know, however, is that the band that would become the residents was formed sometime in 1965 in New Orleans, Louisiana. Wanting to ride the zeitgeist of the flower power movement, the members, as we'll call them, set out from Louisiana sometime in 1966 for San Francisco. However, before they could reach San Francisco, the band's vehicle broke down in the San Mateo area of California. Figuring, hey, this is good enough, they ended up setting up shop at their point of landing, or rather breaking down, instead of the previous destination of San Francisco. After acquiring cheap recording equipment, working odd jobs, the members set about creating their first recordings. Even on these first unreleased and still as of yet unheard recordings, the members of a then unnamed group pursued a decidedly cutting edge avant-garde direction with their music. Particularly, they were interested in applying a postmodern deconstructionist approach to rock music which in the early 1970s was at its absolute apex. Once said recordings were complete, the members of what would become the residents decided the best thing to do would be to send their tapes to Hal Halverstadt, the man at Warner Brothers Records responsible for signing Captain Beefheart. The members had high hopes that their avant-garde boundary-pushing sound would engender the same interest that Beefheart had to Warner Brothers Records. This, of course, turned out to be not the case at all. Halverstadt rejected their demo. However, not knowing the name of the group who had reached out to him, he simply addressed the rejection to the residents. While it might have seemed matter-of-fact or not that important to Halverstadt, the various members of a then unnamed group took it upon themselves to officially christen themselves with the nominal aside. They henceforth became known as the Residents. Despite the rejection, the group then known as the Residents were not deterred. It was due to the theories of a Bavarian philosopher, Ensenada. He pioneered the theory of obscurity that artists should not strive for artistic recognition, commercial success, or any other form of mass exposure. In fact, his theory posited that artists could only create true work in utter obscurity. Okay, here is where I will need to interject and do a sort of meta-commentary on the history of the resonance. Uh, the reason for this is there is no evidence that, quote, Ensenada ever existed. There is also no evidence that this, quote, theory of obscurity is a real thing, but it might be. This is the beauty and madness of trying to explain the history of the residents. They themselves claimed multiple times through representatives of their front company, the Cryptic Corporation, 
don't worry, we'll get to it, that Ensenada was in fact a real person who was born in Bavaria in 1907 and died in 1993, and all the while continued to inform and advise the residents throughout his life. And who's to say there wasn't some small German man advising the members of the residents? But also, it is equally likely all this is deliberate obscurantism. Which is true? Up for you to decide. So, anyway, following the rejection from Halverstadt and Warner Brothers, the residents were determined to further their avant-garde music slash performance art any way they could. With this in mind, they decided to move on from San Mateo and relocated to 20 Sycamore Street in San Francisco, their original destination. Part recording studio, part performance art space, this address is where the residents would do some of their most iconic 70s work. In 1972, they formed their own independent record label, Ralph Records, in order to record and distribute their soon-to-be-released albums and EPs. Seeing the residents were a bit strapped for cash, they first recorded their debut EP, Santa Dog, instead of a full-length LP, to conserve costs. The members of the residents then sent out this EP of their unique style of music to various radio stations around the West Coast, and, well, seeing as this was the era of Kenny Loggins, Carol King, and James Taylor, Let's just say the residents had a hard time convincing any local DJs to give their music a spin. Finally though, on a chance, a local Portland DJ named Bill Reinhardt gave the EP a play live on the air, and to his surprise, a contingent of weirdos and freaks dialed up to declare their love for the new residents record. The success of the EP gave the members of the residents the confidence they needed to go forward with their deconstruction of western pop rock. It was also around this time of the move to San Francisco and the release of the Santa Dog EP that the residents invited some of their closest associates, including Hardy Fox, Homer Flynn, Jay Clem, and John Kennedy down to San Francisco to establish what would be known as the Cryptic Corporation, an overhead company that would handle all of the residents' affairs, including press, tour bookings, radio, record distribution, as well as working in close concert with Ralph Records to get their music in as many stores as possible. Now again, I need to pause and do a bit of an interjection. It is entirely possible that the four men I just named as, quote, associates of the residents are in fact the residents. Again, there is no definitive proof that this is the case, so maybe they're not. Hardy Fox did come out just before he passed away in 2018 and declared himself as the primary composer of the residents' music and its lifelong band leader. Is this true? Highly likely. But can we say for sure that this is the case? Well, this is the residents we are talking about, so I think you know the answer. Either way, rest in peace to Hardy Fox, who was an absolute legend in the Residence universe, no matter what role he played. Anyway, returning to the state of the Residence in the early 1970s, we find them set up in San Francisco, with a capable team around them, and the energy and drive to really get going. Now, before I go any further, I have to state, the history of the Residence is long, complex, and never boring, that's for sure. For a band that truly remained on the outskirts of the avant-garde for the entirety of their career, they were more prolific than most mainstream artists with infinitely larger budgets and reach. So in order to distill down every twist and turn in the Residents' storied career, I highly recommend you all go watch the incredible 2015 documentary, Theory of Obscurity, a film about the Residents. With that being said, I do want to selectively go over some of the crazy, out there, experimental, one-of-a-kind nature of the residents' music, especially as it relates to the general music atmosphere in the decades they operated, including this current one. First off, we start in the 1970s. The residents released their debut album, Meet the Residents, in 1974, and let's just say no one else could have made this record. The cover art was a hilarious vandalization of the Beatles' Meet the Beatles, and the music was just as absurd. First, while the album was made by a quote, band, in this case the residents, it's better to view this as more of them taking on a deconstructionist version of a band, as the music and sounds on the record are made solely through mashing up various prior recorded sounds and sequencing them together. Not so much to resemble songs, but let's call them auditory experiences. Meet the Residents mostly use sounds recorded by the residents themselves, and while the sequencing of pre-recorded sounds on tape by a quote, band, 
was stunningly innovative for 1974, it was their next release that the Resonance ended up creating a new influential style of music on their album. On the album Third Reich and Roll, and please YouTube do not demonetize me, it's just an album title, the Resonance incorporated recordings of found sounds, other artists' songs, classical recordings, live jazz concerts, in addition to their own self-recorded sound fragments in order to create this strange audio collage. In many ways, this showed the Resonance role as innovators of mashup culture decades before it became mainstream on albums like Paul's Boutique or in the works of late 90s early aughts DJs such as Danger Mouse or Girl Talk. As the 70s dragged on, the Resonance profile began to pick up considerably. While they never exactly approached quote, the mainstream, they did manage to make some headway in the punk scene, and this culminated with the surprise success of their cover of the Rolling Stones' Satisfaction. Now, cover might not exactly be an entirely accurate description, and maybe perhaps an artful mangling might suffice instead. Either way, I think this is one of those things you just need to hear to understand. This alignment with the punk scene only grew with the further 70s releases of Eskimo, a sound collage concept album about the Inuit life in the Great North, not available, which was recorded contemporaneously with the debut, but released four years later after the residents supposedly forgot about its existence, which fit perfectly with Ensenada's theory of obscurity, according to the residents. And Duck Stab, perhaps the residents' most, quote, punk album. Again, I'm using these terms loosely here, folks. The album featured short, relatively guitar-based songs with highly distorted vocals and of course the Resonance stream of consciousness sound collage technique. This ended up making Duck Stab the Resonance most popular album to date in the 1970s. As the 70s came to a close, in many ways, the Resonance were at the height of their powers. They had been written about in various punk and punk adjacent magazines in the UK including Melody Maker, Sounds, and NME. Nonetheless, keeping with the Resonance theory of obscurity, they gave no credence to any exposure they may have received from their late 70s successes. They even inaugurated the 80s by releasing The Commercial Album, an album that included 40 one-minute song fragments that should be looped in various ways, according to the residents, to create hit songs. But again, keeping with the previously mentioned theory of obscurity, they abandoned their quasi-success and pursued three album releases and a tour under the quote, Mole Trilogy. Well, technically it wasn't a trilogy because they never completed all three releases, but nonetheless. The Mold Trilogy was a reaction to their recent surge of influence and the perceived decline that followed thereafter. The albums marked the first in a series of subtle shifts in the Resonance music as the Mold Trilogy, again, uncompleted Mold Trilogy, saw the group begin to incorporate influences from the nascent industrial scene as well as greater emphasis on the use of drum machines and production techniques that were beginning to see their inception at the beginning of the 80s. While the album depicts a societal struggle between the moles and the chubs, some fans were quick to seize on the alleged allegory of the residents versus the mainstream. The Mark of the Mole was followed up with the Tunes of Two Cities before the residents decided to scrap the trilogy in order to regain financial footing after a successful yet financially draining tour. Following the aborted Mole trilogy, the 80s saw the residents release a series of quote, American composer albums, where they honored a series of American composers in a way only the residents could. These composers included John Philip Sousa and George Gershwin, among others. Following this, in a series of live albums and tours, the residents released what might be my personal favorite residents album. God in Three Persons. I mentioned a lot about this album at the top, so I won't repeat myself except to say, if you have to start somewhere, start here. A talking blues pseudo-rock opera about sexual confusion, medicine show charlatanry, and conjoined twins cannot be missed. Throughout the 90s, one of the most remarkable aspects about The Residents, besides their continued prolific output, was their commitment to wholeheartedly embracing new technology. As the residents released iconic albums such as Wormwood, a rock opera in a similar style to God and Free Persons, they also followed this up by exploiting the then nascent CD-ROM technology that was becoming available to more and more Americans. Specifically, on an album like Gingerbread Man, the residents fully incorporated this multimedia approach into the presentation of their musical works. And much of the artwork throughout the 90s and into the early 2000s featured the typical Windows 98 early 3D graphics iconic to the time. 
As the 90s drew into the 2000s, the residents continued to release new work exploring new concepts such as anthropomorphism, the album's Bunny Boy and Animal Lover, and a meditation on the state of the modern world on an album like Demons Dance Alone. In addition, the residents took part in a series of groundbreaking tours that not only celebrated their 30th anniversary, but utilized new technology to bring some of their most abstract concepts to life in more detail than ever thought possible. As the 2010s turned into the 2020s, the residents showed no sign of slowing down with numerous releases and tours as well as the characteristic adaptation to new technology. 2015 saw the release of the aforementioned documentary, The Theory of Obscurity. And in 2020, the residents continued to evolve, experimenting for the first time with blues rock on the Metal, Meat, and Bone album. The residents are by far the most interesting underground band in American history. This is an undisputed fact. Sound collage, to avant-garde concept albums, to industrial noise, to jazz and blues electronica, the residents have done it all. Especially when considering the context from when they emerged in the mid-70s, far before the internet gave independent artists the autonomy we are familiar with today, it is even more amazing that they were able to pursue their artistic vision without compromise, and not only survive, but thrive. No matter what kind of music you like, I guarantee you listening to The Residents will forever alter your perspective about what Western contemporary music even is. And that is why The Residents should no longer be lost.